Well, good morning, church. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Chris Koenig, and I'm on staff here at Woodside. It's my pleasure to be here with all of you today. I want to start by wishing everyone who's a dad a very happy Father's Day. Uh, this year is kind of particularly special for me, as you may have seen earlier. A couple of my really close friends just became dads, and I just want to cheer you guys on and tell you how excited I am for you. Over the last week or so, I asked a couple dads from our church, if you could say something to the fathers of Woodside on Father's Day, what would you say? And all of them, without exception, said something in the same theme. And that theme was set the tone. Dads, we look up to you. We trust you to lead us. So I want to encourage you all to set the tone in your homes. Now, maybe more than ever, those kids are watching you and they're seeing exactly how you live out your faith. Uh, you, you got this, dads. Uh, point us towards our Heavenly Father. We love you. Dad, I love you. Thanks for everything you do. Would you guys just join with me as we pray to begin? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning for revealing yourself to us. Thank you for the countless fingerprints you've left for us in nature. Thank you for your holy scriptures. Thank you for the testimony of other believers. And thank you, Lord, for sending us your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. So naturally, like a lot of you guys, I watched my dad growing up, and I took on a few of his qualities. Uh, one of those is his sense of adventure. And I mean, my dad's got a sense of adventure. My crazy old man skydived for his 40th. <laughs> I'm not quite in that tier, but I too enjoy a good adrenaline rush. Thankfully, I was blessed with buddies who feel the same way. And so when we graduated high school, we decided let's go on a whitewater rafting trip. Now the place we went was six or seven hours away. And so we had to take a couple vehicles uh, with all the guys who were coming along. And on the way there, the vehicles kind of got separated and the vehicle in which I was a passenger happened to find ourselves on the scenic route. We got really lost. <laughs> At first, we frantically tried to get back exactly on the GPS route. Uh, this was pre-internet on the phone, so we weren't even sure really where we were. And then suddenly we realized that wherever we had ended up, this road that we were on was leading us through the most amazing stretch of towns. Now, these towns weren't particularly amazing because they were so beautiful. No, they became amazing to us because we found the names of these towns hilarious. They were so funny, it became a game to us. We began pulling over to take pictures with the road signs. Meanwhile, the other vehicles are texting us like, where are you guys? You're totally lost. And we, thinking we're funny, are texting back, oh yeah, uh, we just took a UE in Lodi and then an accidental Larry in Moose Creek. We just think we're the funniest boys in the whole world. And that all culminated with a stop at this quaint little number. Ah yes, Fisky's Corners. I can't say I remember much of what the metropolis of Fisky's Corners is like, <laughs> but I sure do remember that sign. And so this morning, we are in week three of our sermon series, Signs, a series on the miracles of Jesus. And I, I like to ask the why of things. So why? Why are we doing this? Well, we are looking at Christ's miracles, not to become enamored with the sign, like us boys were with Fisky's Corners, but instead to fall in love with the one who is doing the signs. 
Pastor Dan likened it to a road sign our very first week. Like, you and I don't get all excited at the beauty of that little blue Elmira sign when we drive into town. No, we get excited about home. Similarly, we don't worship the miracles of Jesus, just like we don't worship creation. We worship the creator, the miracle worker. We praise God. In this series, we've been going through a few of the seven miracles that we find in the Gospel of John. And John records far fewer miracles than the other Gospel writers. And almost all of the ones he does include are unique to his Gospel. And this hints at intention on John's part. He purposed to include these miracles specifically. And he's using them to illustrate something for the reader. Thankfully, we don't have to speculate what that something is or why John put these in his book. He tells us outright as to his purpose in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John's goal in describing a few of the miracles Jesus performed is that those who read them would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in that belief, it would lead to a life lived for his name. And honestly, that's the goal of this series too. It's no secret. <laughs> if you find yourself tuning in to Woodside's services each week, we are sharing with you the miracles of Jesus so that you would believe that he is the Messiah, that he is God, and that in your belief, you would find the fullest life. That's our big picture purpose. And that's our goal this morning, that is you hear the word of God, he would work in your heart, and you would begin a relationship with him. And if you're already a believer, that as you hear the word of God, he would work in your heart, and you would deepen your relationship with him. So no secrets. Here at Woodside, we are about inviting our neighbors to real life with Jesus. And curiously enough, that's what John is doing as he writes his gospel. So I invite you to come take a look at Jesus with me. This morning we are in John chapter 5, so you can crack open your Bibles or pull it up on your device. And my wife Katie is going to read it for us now. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there for a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed, and he walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man, said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, as there was a crowd in the place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. 
the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the stage is set when Jesus comes to Jerusalem with the disciples and they enter this pool area. Now there are lots of unwell people here, but Jesus is drawn to just one of them. In verse 6, it says that he saw him lying there and he knew already that this man had been there a long time. And the words knew that, uh, some translations translate it learned that, those words imply a supernatural knowledge. Jesus wells up with compassion for this man. And without this man asking for it, he initiates a conversation with him. Do you want to be healed? The man's like, uh, yes, of course. <laughs> but I can't be because I can't get into the pool quickly enough. Now, some of you may have noticed already that verse 4 doesn't exist in your Bibles. Or if it does, it's somewhere in the footnotes. And that is because it isn't in our earliest manuscripts of the Gospel of John. It was likely added later. But the omitted verse reads this. From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. And the first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. Some context. Now, we're not positive that that's true, since we don't count it as inspired scripture. But we do see in the response of the man in verse 7 that that's likely what he believed. And it's probably a local, at least myth or legend, because we see so many other ill people gathered around there. So they seemed to believe that that was true. But Jesus chooses to display his power directly in the man's life. Now, he could have caused the pool to bubble and then helped the man in. But instead, he cuts out the middleman, so to speak. Like, there are heaps of people laying around here, hoping that the pool will stir. Hoping, trusting in this pool for relief. And yet, publicly, Jesus offers them something greater. He says to the man, get up, take your bed and walk, and the man is healed. Now, because it's a Sabbath day, the Jewish leaders attempt to make this an issue. They tell the man he's doing way too much work for a Sabbath by carrying his mat, which is kind of shocking that that's what they take out of this, because they likely would have recognized this man. He's been there for 38 years. They probably knew him. But they don't praise God for this healing, nor do they identify with the man. And the man sort of passes the blame for his work onto Jesus, even though he doesn't know Jesus by name yet. He says, the guy who told me to do this is the guy who healed me. But then later, Jesus finds him in the temple. You probably notice that's a new location, uh, which shows us that Jesus continued to seek this man out. Now it's possibly the same day. But he says to him, see, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. That last part kind of throws us a little bit. Like, is that a threat? But we know that sin often, but not always, has direct if not immediate consequences here on earth. And also that ultimately sin is a cruel master who pays its slaves in death. Now Jesus could be warning the man here either of the present harms that sin causes to people or of the future judgment where sin will ultimately be punished. And then the man goes and tells the religious leaders that it was Jesus who did the healing, which actually ultimately will contribute to their resistance against his ministry. So there's the story. 
That's what our God did on earth for a paralyzed man in Jerusalem around 30 AD. And it is amazing. A paralyzed man regained or received for the very first time the ability to walk of his own accord. I'm so thankful we have it recorded for us here in history. But maybe you're like me. And although you love the parts of scripture that are the narrative, that are the telling of the story, maybe you too struggle to find, well, what does that have to do with me right now? Like, I certainly feel like that if I read a Bible story and I love the plot aspect of it, but maybe I don't feel like there's any direct or like overarching principles that I can glean for my life. Why does this story matter to my story? So why does this story matter in my story? And really, like, this is what we should do with Scripture every time we come to it. We seek God in prayer to reveal to us through the Holy Spirit what He has for us in here. How do I apply the healing of the paralytic to my walk, pun intended, with Christ today? Sometimes we come to God's Word and we treat it like information, like it's a textbook. Uh, or other times maybe we're tempted to treat it as fiction, like it's some fantasy to get caught up in. But the book of Hebrews tells us that God's word is living and active. Christians can catch a glimpse of God in these pages as the Holy Spirit reveals to us more of the Son. And for our specific passage this morning, thankfully, the Apostle John does put his purpose statement right in the text. And that's point one this morning. God gave us these signs that we might believe. John isn't shy about this. <laughs> Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he selected specific miracles from his time with Jesus for the purpose of evangelism. John tells us that Jesus did other miracles too. In John 21, he writes, There are many other things that Jesus did, and were every one of them to be written, I suppose the world itself couldn't contain the books that would be written. He includes these specific ones here so that we, the reader, would believe. And in John 20, a reminder, he hopes that we will believe in two things. That Jesus is the Christ and that Jesus is is the Son of God. Like two identity statements. Jesus is the Christ. That's the word for Messiah. He's the promised rescuer, not only for Israel, but for the, all the people of earth. And Jesus is the Son of God. He's equal with the Father. He's eternal and ever-existing, uncreated and ruler over history. And then John leaves it to the reader to decide. But remember, this isn't like a cold recollection of events. Like, John is one of Jesus' best friends. He walked with him and learned from him and committed his life to building his kingdom. And he was there. <laughs> He wants to let us in on the most exciting parts of his life. Things that altered his life. He saw Jesus. And he wants us to see Jesus too. He wrote these things so that we might believe. So, do you believe? What do you believe? Do you believe that there is more than the natural? Do you believe that the supernatural exists? John gives us an example of the supernatural. A supernatural healing done by the one who created the natural long before he entered into it as a man. 
God gave us these signs that we might believe. But further than that, point two, God invites us to move from a superstitious belief into a tangible relationship. Now, if you would have gone over point one with the paralyzed man, he would have said, yeah, I believe. I believe in God. Uh, I also believe that if this pool bubbles at just the right time and I happen to slip in there, then either the pool or God, doesn't really matter which, will heal me. That seems kind of like archaic and, and ancient to think that we might believe some stirring water might cause us to be healed. But do we do similar things elsewhere? Have we put our faith in things that were never meant to save us? Are you banking on your marriage to rescue you? Or your political party? Or essential oils? Have we tacked something on to the side of the gospel and deemed it as critical to our being made right with God? Maybe for you it's your own performance. Or maybe it's human progress in general. Well, in our story, Jesus cuts right through any musings about this. And about whether it's the power of God in the pool or the pool plus God or whatever. He just eliminates the pool entirely. He rewrites the man's equation. The man's like, God plus bubbles equals healing. But no, Jesus plus nothing equals wholeness. There's no additional requirements. There's no priest to mediate the interaction with God. There's no indulgences to be paid. There is no nothing. A relationship with Jesus is the full requirement for wholeness. And God wants us as believers to move and to grow and to deepen our understanding of him. We don't blindly accept him and then just sit there with like some superstitious belief. Now, the brother of Jesus, James, addressed that in his gospel. Well, it's not his gospel, his book in the Bible. <laughs> he writes to believers to encourage them to grow in their relationship with Christ. He says to them, so you believe. Great. So do the demons. But it does nothing for them. Their belief that Jesus is God is not a relationship with him. Now, the demons are a separate sermon. But for us people who believe in Christ, it has to change us. It has to be more than a mission statement. It has to be a real relationship. Let me give you an example. It might be like this. Let's say a few years ago, I'm still single and I'm praying, God, please show me who my wife is going to be. And then thunder and lightning, bam, boom, the door swings open and Katie marches in. And God's like, there she is, that's your wife. I'm like, awesome. <laughs> there she is. That is, that is good to know. Then let's say I do nothing about that. I don't pursue her. I don't get to know her. I don't grow in intimacy with her. I don't learn about her. I don't communicate with her. It's a pretty superficial marriage. It doesn't fulfill its intention. And it's a ridiculous picture. <laughs> Similarly, if we don't move our belief in Jesus into a tangible, real relationship with him, we don't fulfill his intention. It's just as ridiculous a picture. Now, Jesus goes and finds the paralytic afterwards. He re-reveals himself to him. He says to him, look, I made you well. Now, obey me. Relate to me. Sin no more. It's interesting that John doesn't tell us whether or not this man became a disciple. His concern is not so much the specific interaction but instead the reaction of the reader. 
He wants us to think about our response to Jesus. So have we fragmented our faith and made it like some Sunday morning obligation or some status to put on a census form or a team to be a part of? Or have we moved that belief into a tangible relationship with God? That brings us to point three, that our God is not bound by social norms or religious traditions or any other kind of restraint. I think we often expect God to work inside of the parameters of our own understanding. Like our individual picture of God somehow represents the whole of God, and therefore we know how he's going to act in a particular situation. Like the paralytic expected God to use the pool to heal him, like perhaps he had done in the past. Or like the religious leaders, the Pharisees expected Jesus to do his work Sunday to Friday, and leave Saturday the Sabbath alone. But Jesus doesn't play ball with either expectation. He acts in such a way as to reveal the heart of his Father to everyone he meets. Jesus refused to be trapped by preconceived notions of what a Messiah should do, and instead accomplished perfectly everything the Messiah must do. But this man, the paralytic, is desperate. And the pool, that's like his fourth quarter dying seconds Hail Mary toss. Like he's just throwing up anything towards the end zone. Just hoping for a win. Interestingly enough, that phrase for a last ditch or like desperate effort comes from a prayer that the Catholic Church has used for centuries. Where in a sticky situation... You, you hail Mary. You cry out to Mary, the mother of Jesus, to intercede to Jesus on your behalf. And the man is doing a similar thing here, hoping that the pool will somehow relay his longing unto God and he will be healed. But there's just one problem with that. It's entirely unnecessary. Jesus is right there in front of him. And because Jesus Christ came to earth, we too can go straight to the source. He is our advocate before the Father. And similarly, Jesus shows the paralytic that it isn't the pool that he needs. It's Jesus himself. But we can pray for miracles as Christians. I've been praying for a few lately. But more than wanting to see a sign from God, we should want to see God. We should be desiring a deepening of our understanding of Him. We don't want to miss Jesus because we were so preoccupied with the sign. We don't want to miss Jesus because we were so preoccupied with the sign. Can I be frank with all of you guys? Like, for about, a, for about a month or so there, I was just so saddened that we couldn't meet together physically that I couldn't even really enjoy the fellowship we were having. I was struggling to let God speak to me, struggling to worship on Sunday mornings with all of you. Because I had it in my mind that God was going to fix this and let us get back to loud singing and hug greetings and I just became kind of fixated on that. But I realized recently that I've been missing Jesus right in front of me. So church family, keep praying for a miracle. It's good to cry out to God, believing that he can do great things. Pray for our church. Pray for the future, for direction. Pray for your spouse, for your kids, for your neighbors. Pray for a miracle. 
And as you wait for God to move, focus on Him. Believe in Him. Move into a more intimate bond with Him. And then when you witness the miraculous, don't gawk at the miracle. Glorify our God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the miraculous signs that you've given us. And Lord, we thank you that you've called us to believe. Heavenly Father, help our unbelief. Would you deepen our understanding of you and our relationship with Jesus Christ? Lord, we ask these things in his name. Amen.